My name is Mark Simpson, and I've had three scones. I just feel better for saying it and owning up to it. Thank you very much, the Clayton Hotel. That was wonderful. And please, please, please stay for lunch if you possibly can. That will be served from around about 1.30 onwards. But between now and then, we're going to unpack and unpick a little bit more at this whole theme of how we deal with OTAs and how the tourism industry here can respond. Ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to have another panel discussion, and I would again welcome your questions later on. Representing Booking.com, we're going to have Alan Bullock, who's a senior account manager at Booking.com. Representing LastMinute.com, we've got John Gavin, who's regional head of UK and Ireland for LastMinute.com. And she's back, all the way from TripAdvisor Experiences. Please welcome back Isabel Bannister and our panel. Thank you. So, Alan, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, I um, work with Booking.com, have done so for three years, um, looking after a team of people who look after Scotland and Northern Ireland. I also work closely with our um, team in Dublin who look after um, Republic of Ireland. Um, so, so, yeah, it's been, it's been a good three years. A lot's, a lot's changed. Um, Booking.com continues to, to grow as a fairly big company. It's part of Booking Holdings, which takes in Agoda, um, rental table, rental cars, um, kayak. So it, it's got like a good support mechanism, um, but it does play a big big part of booking a couple of million rooms per night of late. Um, so yeah, good place. And you've sat back and listened to everything today, anything that you want to say, anything that you want to counteract? Are you happy enough with what's been said so far? No, I'm happy enough with what's been said. It's good to to see all, like all, all viewpoints and all, all aspects instead of being kind of stereotyped into what I see in the market. Um, there's been a lot of changes within the three years. Like I, I recall three years ago it would be like the larger three, four, five star properties would be listed on the site and they would list in a certain order. So it's, it's really great to see how it's extended to apartments and um, single unit properties through to the, the, large, fa the large five star market. So, Huge growth and huge um, opportunity to grow further. Have you been talking to Billy? Because Billy accosted me during my third scone and said, we haven't talked enough <laughs> about some of these smaller businesses. We're going to come on to that. Trust me, Billy, we will. John, lastminute.com's got three plugs from the BBC already, and I don't do advertising. Tell us a little bit more yeah, about it. Amazing. Thank, thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, so um, I'm John Gavin. I look after uh, a team of market managers who, in turn, uh, contract and manage the relationships with our, uh, with our accommodation providers throughout the UK and Ireland. Um, some of you may know a little bit of the history of lastminute.com. We were, we were founded in 1998 and see ourselves very much as the granddaddy of the industry and uh, we were quite often called the, the darling of the dot-com bubble. Oh. Um, which obviously went horribly wrong for everybody. So we're, we're currently, uh, we were just acquired uh, just a couple of years ago and are now based in Switzerland. So whilst we were founded by Martha Lane Fox and uh, Brent Hoberman famously 20 years ago, and we're celebrating our 20th birthday this year, uh, we are now Swiss owned, traded on the Swiss stock market and are now known as the lastminute.com group. Um, an umbrella which encompasses a number of other websites around Europe. The good news from this is that whilst if you look traditionally at lastminute.com, 95% of our business would have been UK outbound. We were very much a UK focused business with domains also in France, Italy and Spain. Um, nowadays we are much more of the business is coming from France, from Italy, from Spain, and now more recently from Germany. We've seen great growth from Germany as well. Um, and that really is uh, lastminute.com today. It's an interesting story because folk in the room would be aware of situations whereby you're the market leader and then all of a sudden people start parking their tanks on your lawn. But you've survived and you're holding your head very high. Are there any lessons from that? Well, more than surviving, uh, it's, it's common knowledge. You, know, you only have to read the press to see that uh, lastminute.com never made a profit until this year. This is actually the first year that we will make a profit. So uh, that's a remarkable thing to have to admit and to say, but it's, it's a fact. 
the reasons behind it were very much uh, we were in an acquisition mode. We were buying up smaller companies around us, certainly under the, uh, the stewardship of uh, Martha Lane Fox and Brent Hoberman. In recent years, that's been consolidated. We've shed quite a lot of the deadwood, and we're now a much more lean machine. So you held your nerve. Is there a lesson in that for us I all? think there very much is. And uh, um, one of the things that we, we realised quite early on, with uh, due deference to my colleague here beside me, is you cannot compete with certain uh, some of our competitors. So we decided we would do something slightly different. So we have, if I look at, uh, if I take Ireland as a, an island destination, I look at Dublin, I look at Belfast. If I go back, and I'm with lastminute.com for 12 years, so quite a considerable chunk of the 20, um, if I go back to near the beginning, I would say that probably 80% of our business was hotel only. People had booked their flights elsewhere or their, their, their method of transport had been booked elsewhere. They only came to us for the, for the accommodation. Today, that has completely turned on its head. We're now seeing 70% of people booking a package. So that includes the flight and the hotel. We're now putting more and more effort into ancillaries, so into car hire, into attractions. Obviously, that's something that's having to be married into our existing technology. It's going to take time to develop. And uh, obviously, as well, we are concentrating on London, Barcelona, Paris, the main destinations to get that up and running but it will, be, it will be wheeled out everywhere. Thanks, John. That leads us beautifully to Isabel. Isabel, we know what you do in terms of experiences, but these different markets that, that John talks about, you know, whether it be North America compared to Central Europe, how, how, how do we tailor towards those markets? So from the experiences side, there isn't anything in particular that we you know, do different for different markets. What we do do is we encourage our suppliers to have as much of availability available as possible. So for the US Australian market, they tend to book that bit further in advance. So we try to encourage our suppliers to have availability, which is further in advance, say a year in advance. And then for more of our domestic um, European markets, they'll be a bit more last minute um, and a bit more maybe a bit of the shorter duration. So we encourage to get some of that last minute availability. Alan, in terms of different markets? Yeah, what we're seeing in um, different markets is a, a big variation in the way people like to pay. <laughs> it's a big, um, a big factor, which is key to key to ourselves just now. Like in, within in the China market, 70% of people will use what we call hybrid payments, but it will be WeChat, um, sorry, WePay, Alipay, um, or Apple Pay. Is like, so if, you're, if you can't accept those payments, then you're potentially missing out on 70%. Globally, the number is 40%. So for direct models, I think it's key that people, or, or on Booking.com's platforms, um, are able to accept those payments because the the mindset of people pay by credit cards is deteriorating fairly rapidly and globally it's at forty percent do not use credit cards for because they don't like to input the data on their phone, like fifty nine percent of bookings are now on mobile devices and there's a the mindset of people keen not to, to share that information on a mobile device. So um, for for your direct models, um, or for booking.com, it's key to be to be looking at these alternative payments. So payments, John, anything else that you would highlight in terms of tailoring to the different markets? Um, well, if I look at the, the trends that we're seeing from different markets, um, it's undeniable that somebody coming from near Europe, so UK or from, say, from London or from Paris or from Madrid, they're coming on a shorter stay. Those longer haul markets, there's a lot more thought goes into it, it's a much longer stay. And it's a much longer lead-in, so it's booked in with much longer in advance. So the, the availability of flights from near Europe with Ryanair, with EasyJet and so on into, into Irish airports is key to all of it. And it's certainly how we analyse what, what destinations we're going to feature, to what degree we're going to feature them. We look at flight availability, we look at flight pricing, and we try to tailor that as much as we can to the needs of those markets based on flight availability. And before I get, what about the smaller end of the market? You know, maybe one, four or five star self-catering unit. John, any okay. advice to those sorts of people? Well, well another trend that's very apparent, and uh, it actually brings us back to 
the, to the presentation we saw at TripAdvisor earlier on, I noticed that, um, that the score, the average score from North America was particularly high and was considerably lower for, for Italy and Spain. I knew immediately why that was, and if you look at the Italian and Spanish markets, they tend to book at the two and three star end of the market. Really? Yes, they do. Uh, they're much more price, price conscious. Americans, for whatever reason, best known to themselves, are much more brand loyal, will stick to the Hiltons and the Marriott's and the, the higher end product. Uh, but very definitely amongst the Spanish and the Italians, they will, they will tend to book more budget accommodation. Um, the French, as well, are more likely to book a B and B type product. We find so. One of the things that we're doing as well is uh, we are a limited. My team is limited in size, despite the fact that the company has 1,200 employees worldwide. My team is limited in size. I cannot get to every single accommodation provider in the UK and Ireland, and so we concentrate on the ones where we have the highest volumes. And the others we buy through third parties. Right. So whilst there are quite a number of you in the room with whom I have direct relationships, there are many here that I do not have a relationship, but you will still find your product available on our website. Gotcha, gotcha. And Alan, can you understand that mentality? Somebody's got a small premises, but bespoke premises on the North Antrim coast. They're thinking, I really want to go with these giants. What would you say? Yeah, I think it, um, there's nothing, there's little to lose, I would say. Um, like on a platform like Booking.com, you put your um, accommodation on the site and bookers get access to it. One, one thing that's changed um, for, the, for the smaller products, it, um, or the smaller maybe two or three bedroom individual units, is that we now, like Amazon and Netflix, when you go on to Booking.com, it will it will look at previous search history, and if you're if you typically um, look at four star chain hotels, that what what will be not placed in front of you, but typically a large um, ranked higher. But if someone usually searches for coastal um, resorts or coastal cottages, then there'll be more more of an influence or more impact on ability for them to be seen on our site. So. It's very much like mach machine learning or user, or user um, tracked or delivered to, to give the, the booker a good experience, but also to ensure that the right type of customer is coming to your property, which is crucial for review scores. We now see as a result of that, people will give a, a higher review score because it's, what, it's the product, type of product which they like, as opposed to being placed into something which was just at the top of the page, which attracts a lot of views and clicks. And you know, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked the other panel about negotiations. Is there any flexibility in there for the little guy? For me, in terms of the rates? <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking the Scotsman here. Yeah, the rates, the rates are, are input by the, um, by, the, by the properties themselves. We have no influence on the rates. But in terms of commission, etc., you know, is there any bargaining power that, that these smaller properties would have in terms of coming to you to say, can you cut me a deal here? No, I think like, um, it's a, a level playing field across the country or, or globe for that matter. John, same with you. Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, there is always flexibility and we, we're well known in the industry for being as flexible as, you know, as can be. However, I would, let's be realistic about this. If we're talking about a property that has perhaps five rooms mm. and it's in a destination where we have very little volume, very little traffic, to what extent am I going to commit resources to building a site, for, you know, building a presence for this property on our website uh, and also cut the commission? Look, that's the reality. That's the reality. The reality is that I can still feature that property it will come through perhaps a third party, but I won't, I, to be frank, I won't contract the hotel or the, the property directly. Gotcha. Let's widen it out a little bit, Isabel, in terms of the bundling. Bundling seems to be where it's at. It's how the market is evolving. What advice would you have in terms of bundling experiences? I mean, that's, is that what you do? 
So for the experience side again, it's not really, we don't really bundle um, hotels and activities together. That would be something more that our suppliers would do. And we definitely get a lot of our suppliers um, trying to get us involved, which is something that we're more than happy to do as well. So we try and give as much information as possible or any kind of ideas that we can add certain attractions into a multi-day tour, day trip. Um, so that's something that we pretty much do. Again, it probably kind of relates to our CRM newsletters. So we, if somebody's booked a hotel through our website, we then go and try and encourage a lot of the activities um, that are available through, through our websites. What about you guys in terms of bundling? Yeah, for experiences, is, well, it feels quite new, but it's maybe, I'll guess, 18 months. Um, so within, globally, we're in the hundreds in terms of destinations. Within, currently within um, the Ireland and the Republic Island, we have Cork, Dublin, and Belfast live on our site. So if you book a um, hotel in any of those three destinations, following your booking, you will be offered a selection of experiences, whether that be um, bus tours or bungee jump and unit like whatever um, is in supply. But what we're, we're looking to move on to is like a, a pay now model, which we'll, is where we'll see main traction. But obviously for length of stay, which is attractive for everyone, um, if people are going to a destination and they can see what stuff there is to do there, they may be likely to stay for five instead of three or seven instead of five. Um, and it also increases the size of the marketplace, I would say. But we, we would hope that it improves length of stay. Exactly. John? Uh, similar. Um, we, it's nothing new to us. Uh, if you look at London, for example, we famously, a number of years ago, passed through the one million theatre ticket threshold in a, in a single year. Um, so selling uh, theatre tickets as part of a package is something that we've been doing for some time. However, bringing in other attractions in multiple destinations is something that we're working towards. It's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's something we very much want to do because it does drive a lengthier stay. It is something we can monetize and it's most definitely part of our future plan and it's something we're working on currently. And Isabel, in terms of experiences, uh, again I've asked this question to the other panel, is it the old favourites over here that are attracting attention or, or what is it about us that, that folk out there like at the moment? Um, so, well, you know, when, when customers are heading over to, to the destination, they have the top things that they want to do, so such as the Giants Causeway, um, Titanic Belfast, so these are the things that we, you know, always try to encourage. Um, and you know it makes their trip as well by having these this, the experiences sector um, in place. And in terms of food and people, would you see that as our unique selling point, or not unique, but big selling point, Alan? Yeah, like when I talk about experiences, um, when we promote it, we put, it's very much like um, it is a bigger bigger players, but also as much as like with instances um, where there's experiences where people invite them in into their home, like for like a, a chef's a chef's meal. Oh, like, right. like a, I'm not saying that's obscure, but like all like a huge wide range of experiences out with like the kind of like, beaten track of experiences is becoming extremely popular popular. Right. I like it. John? Yeah, agreed. Um, the the uh, Game of Thrones experience mm. here, for example, that that's uh, Again, nothing new. If you look at uh, New Zealand as a destination, they had this with Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and uh, those films all being based there, and a massive increase in business following those films. I think, I think that's something that Northern Ireland really needs to keep, keep in motion and encourage uh, lawmakers in Northern Ireland to, to continue to, to encourage filmmaking in Northern Ireland, TV series, whatever, it, and maybe move it a little further west. How do you mean? Well, it seems to be concentrated around the, the East Coast, so we're not right with uh, Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, maybe uh, Mid Ulster and uh, towards Tyrone, Fermanagh areas. I mean, fabulous around Loch Erne and places like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> was, that was that the Mid Ulster crowd? Is that the Mid Ulster crowd? So. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it's something I do, it's, it's close to my own heart. Um, my family are from Donegal as well, so, you know, it's... Oh, whereabouts? Uh, near Kelly Bates. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely, lovely. Uh, 
the, we've got audience participation even before I asked for it. Um, I've, I've now, they've given me a microphone. I'm now armed with a microphone uh, and with a question at the front. Uh, just tell us what you do and then ask your question. Thank you. Right, my name is Ruth. Um, I'm a very micro business. I make jewellery for a living of little iconic images of Northern Ireland. Um, but I've been trying to offer workshops as experiences for people coming over. I don't know from what you've been saying earlier about whether I need to hook in with the hotels and the accommodation providers or whether I go through yourselves. And that's what I would like to know. Where do I go? Please. Um, I would honestly say start with the hotels. It's something that we would very much like to do, but I'm not going to pretend that we can do this now or tomorrow. But it will come at some point, but uh, it's not there yet. And it's a, it's a, it's a technological uh, mountain for us to climb. We're, we're getting up there, but it's, it, there's a long way to go. Any other advice? Seems to be yeah, get in with the hotel. And for ourselves, it would be it would be your choice. Like there's now, you'll have an option with hotels, I'm sure. Um, but the system. As a bundle, yeah, yeah, but, package bundle. Yeah, yeah, but if you wanted to to leave it open to any booking within the local area, um, any booking that was through will then be offered. For example, a jewellery making class or whatever the um, it would be, and we would then supply you with like a, a pay point so you can collect payment. When, so, is it? It will grow, I would say, um, but I would definitely say that it's, it's grown out with like key attractions, which is kind of what I said, like the more um, more authentic or more like home based is yeah. becoming very attractive. And the the um, technology to allow you to facilitate that is is here and it's in but it is it, it is progressing I would say so it would be a good place to look at. Thanks Alan. Thanks Ruth. We've got a question here. Kirsty? So I run the largest bed and breakfast in Mid Ulster, and oh God, take me off. <laughs> um, it's really a question more for Booking.com. Um, we find it very difficult uh, with regards to. I know that Adrian was saying at the beginning about communicating with your customers, your guests. Um, for Booking.com, for anybody to uh, book a room, they don't have to give. Uh, an email address, it usually comes through as a booking.com email address and as well as that they don't have to give a valid mobile number, a valid card, a valid expiry date, anything like that. So my question is are booking.com going to take more responsibility for these bookings or is it all on the hotel? Yeah, I mean we, we, would, take, we would take an email, we wouldn't feed that through though, um, but it would be on hold for we would hold it in case we had to contact the partner. We. Sorry, Kirsty. Sorry, Kirsty. Yeah. If you're going to be on TV, you've got to be on TV properly. Go ahead. We find that with Booking.com, you know, they, they hold this information in case they need to get in contact. Also, for example, if they're doing an investigation yeah. into somebody who maybe has provided incorrect card details, incorrect contact details, they won't feed back the results of that investigation to us. So my question to somebody from the company before, which they couldn't answer, was what good is that information to you when really it should be for us? Yeah. Okay. Two, there's two things here. The, the, the less information the customer needs to provide, the more chance it is that it will convert. So that's a win-win for both. Where, where we're working just now and using technology as well as manpower um, is what we call internalised partner friction. So that's to like, re reduce the, the annoyance on the partner side for, for what we allow to, to, to increase conversion for, for, your own, for your own property or any other property. So things like um, chatbots and like, the technology we're using to, to escape the need to like, have to co contact us or await for an email is um, something which is top of the table or top of the pile in terms of importance just now. And um, our team, which is primarily based in Amsterdam, partner research, like will hear this, are, are actively seeking this feedback. What you what you refer to is like all too all too common, I would say. So it's definitely something that's been been looked at just now. Thanks, Al. Appreciate it. Thank you, Kirsty. And we have one more question over here. I've been rerouted here. It's like old times. 
I will take one more after this while I'm down this neck of the woods. Hello, panel. Um, I'm Ava Robson from Corrick House Hotel and Spa in Clocker, Mid Ulster. Oh! <laughs> Um, just on the back of Adrian's analysis of the um, the cost and the profit margin um, against our OTAs, firstly, was that a shock that um, the OTAs are making more profit per room sold to the actually the, the hotel or property? I thought it was very subjective, if I'm frank, and um, I could give examples that would show perhaps not quite the opposite but that it is a much more even playing field. It may be the case in, with some some hotels, some OTAs but certainly not the case with all. Is there a strategic plan on the back of um, the, the rising costs, uh, living wages going up by four and a half percent come April, um, with those rising costs or energy costs are, are rising on a, on a monthly basis? Is there a strategic plan from OTAs about cost and commissions that, that is going to subsequently come to the customer? Well, as, as cost in hotels increases, we expect the price of the accommodation to increase. Um, so, no, there is no strategic plan to reduce our commissions. Happy Avril. You're going to have to be at 1 o'clock. <laughs> very quickly, very quickly. Sorry. Well, there's 8,000 more bedrooms in, in Belfast alone. Room rate is going to probably have to take a dip. So you're talking about increased room rate. We would say possibly that room rate is going to take, um, is going to suffer. Um, so I don't think, I think that's going to be the reverse. Yes. Well, if, if that's the case, then our, our net commissions will also be decreasing. Fair point. So, um, Avril's asking, does anybody else in the panel want to say anything? Very quickly. We're okay. We've got one last question from the back. You're going to have the final question of the day. My name is Olive Nicholson from Raven Hill House in Belfast. Um, I would like to know um, from you guys how Airbnb has influenced your business model in the last couple of years and how it has affected the way you do business. Has it had any influence on the way you um, operate? Well, whereas I wouldn't say that it's impacted the way we do business, um, we have seen a, a similar growth in the in the desire for different types of property, different types of properties. Like, um, and that that applies not just in Northern Ireland but globally. Um, certain we don't particularly track age or or, or sex when booking. Um, but we see like a, a definite appetite towards a more like more obscure is not the right word, but like for off the beaten track or tree houses, igloos, maybe not necessarily in Northern Ireland, but <laughs> but um, people really <laughs> people really want to kind of like the Instagram generation. They don't want to like post a, necessarily always like a four star chain property or luxury five star. It's like something different which then self-generates because if people see that their friends and family are doing such things then they're looking at different types of um, accommodation. So I would say we're seeing it ourselves and Airbnb, Airbnb will probably will see likewise. So it's not necessarily what they're doing but we're probably seeing kind of similar booking patterns. Good question. John, do you want to say something on that? Yeah, we so we, we've noticed that um, Airbnb is, a, we see it as somewhat separate. So, our direct agreements are invariably with uh, hotels and larger B&Bs and guest houses uh, and apartments. Outside of that, it may surprise you to hear that if you go to lastminute.com and do a search on any destination and then search by price so that the cheapest comes up first, you will actually find Airbnb in amongst our results that are returned. So we're actually working with Airbnb to show their results on our website alongside our own. Gotcha. Didn't know that. And, however, um, my team control the order in which those results appear. Gotcha. Gotcha. Final question to you all. Isabel, uh, the future. The, the question, per cat had to handle it first the last time. You know, the future, where do you think the market is going in terms of experiences? Can you give us mm. any insider knowledge? Yeah, I mean... 
for you know for experiences so um, hotels and airlines have long accepted that online bookings is a key tool to grow your business and only 80 percent of um, activities and tours bookings are booked offline and probably many tour operators actually prefer that only 13 percent of that is actually on real-time connectivity so really for the future for us it's you know getting that experiences sector further online and by us acquiring Boken um, earlier this year that's going to play a critical role in in that mission thanks Isabel gents any fortune telling I would say um, the impact of OTA is, is has been growing for some time and it's not to the hopefully not we from a direct booking perspective there has I would suggest awareness around the importance of user generated detail on, on those sites and the ease of booking like payments and offering alternative payments um, because well, the best written website or the best images if they don't accept payments or they don't have user generated um, reviews is it's going to it, it per, per, perhaps tempt people away from that page because there is this like TripAdvisor or Booking.com like a high volume of reviews they're used to like seeing like a number and being able to compare like if the website if a direct website is like about how great a property is um, end of then it could it could almost like, perhaps push people in another direction so I think user generated and understanding booker patterns especially from a payments perspective would be crucial payments is king isn't it it's a playing a big part just now yeah mm -hmm. gotcha John last word yeah payment for us too we're actually looking at various payment methods but uh, I think that there's people far smarter than me within within the company who are looking to see where this is all going next. Mm. It's something that all OTAs and anyone in in this space has had to be completely on top of. It's such a dynamic industry that you cannot afford to sit back for even five minutes. I think virtual reality, artificial intelligence, driverless cars, there are so many things on the horizon. It's very difficult to mash them together and see exactly where we're going. But there are a lot of very, very clever people who will be sure that we're all there or thereabouts. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our panel. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, John. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, guys. Thanks.